What's up, boo boo? Welcome back. Today, we're going to be looking at the three most notorious gangsters in Singapore's history. Who would have thought we'd have a crazy gunslinging gangster, a drug lord kingpin, and someone called the One Eyed Dragon? Ooh. All born and bred in Singapore, starting with Roland Tan. Don't be fooled by his cute, clean shaven head. Roland Tan was one of the most vicious gangsters in Singapore, once being the head of the largest drug syndicates in the world. Singapore Pride. Don't do drugs, kids. Roland was known as Hai Lam Kia, which translates to Hainanese Kid. And at 24 years old, he was already a feared leader in the Si Tong gang in Singapore. He was known to be a brutal and ruthless fighter, a trait which would prove to be extremely valuable. One night in October 23rd, 1969, Roland, along with 10 members of the Si Tong gang, armed themselves with machetes to attack a rival gang. Classic Singapore gangsterism. Machete. <laughs> The members of the Sitong gang drove two cars and had tailed and cornered the car of their rival gang at the junction of Bras Basar Road. A vicious fight occurred which ended with one member of the rival gang being seriously injured and the other member, Lam Cheng Siu, murdered with multiple stab wounds in his head and arms. His body was left in a nearby drain by the Sitong gang. I guess you could say that Siu was left in the sewers. Sorry. Roland, on the other hand, was just getting started and would soon find himself a fugitive on the run for the murder of Sue. But where would a Singaporean fugitive run to? Not the sewers, but Amsterdam. Upon reaching Amsterdam, Roland and his brethren were received and taken care of by a person known as Johnny. Johnny was a Singaporean seaman who was residing in the Netherlands, and Johnny would soon prove to be one of Roland's closest accomplices. A penniless but ambitious Roland saw how members of another gang, Hong Kong's infamous 14K gang, were doing a thriving drug trade in the city. The Netherlands, with its relaxed attitude and loss towards drugs, made it extremely easy to exploit, and by the 1970s, the drug trade was booming in Amsterdam. It was then that he decided to seize control of the city's underworld. Roland partnered with Johnny and with a dozen fugitives from Singapore, they founded A Gong, which means the company, or short for Gong Si in Mandarin. With only about 10 men, A Gong was a very small outfit compared to the already established Hong Kong triads like the 14K gang, that had hundreds of men Members. In fact, they were puny compared to them. However, what they lacked in numbers, Akong made up with their sheer ruthlessness. Akong was infamous for being vicious and violent. They often found themselves outnumbered in gang clashes but always emerged victorious. Akong members also did not have firearms then but chose to arm themselves with knives. An incident that marked their arrival to the Dutch underworld was when two members of Akong, Johnny and his lieutenant, went to settle a dispute with a rival gang. Johnny's lieutenant severed the rival gang boss's arm with a wakizashi, one of those Japanese swords, when the boss tried to pull a gun on them. The duo escaped but not with a hail of bullets that followed. That sounds like a fucking movie. <laughs> Akong was on the rise. New members started joining after witnessing the ruthlessness of the gang. And in 1976, Akong commandos gunned down the boss of 14K, successfully driving Hong Kong, Taiwan and Thailand gangs out of the region and solidifying their position as the number one player in Amsterdam's vast drug empire. Akong's leaders were draped in Armani and Hugo Boss suits, with revolvers hidden underneath. Much like the scenes from those old Hong Kong movies, they lived a lavish lifestyle and would splurge on women, alcohol and gambling. At its peak, Akong was one of the world's largest drug syndicates. And everything seemed to be going up for Roland and the Akong gang. But unsurprisingly, Roland would soon find himself a victim to one of the most unforgiving vices that would threaten his empire. He was a hardcore gambler. Roland would often blow through huge sums of money gambling every night. It got so bad that he had to embezzle funds from the company to feed his insatiable gambling addiction. This led to the loss of his co-founding member of Akong as Johnny severed his brotherhood with Roland. After finding out about the embezzlement. However, the worst has yet to come. In 1977, the Central Narcotics Bureau of Singapore, or CMB, had learned about Akong's activities. Undercover agents were immediately sent to Amsterdam and other European cities to probe. After months of investigations and collecting data on the syndicate, the CMB launched an international anti-drug operation in 1978, which resulted in the seizure of $10 million worth of heroin and the arrest of more than 50 members of Akong. Among those detained were three of its four key leaders, the last member being Roland who barely escaped. This crackdown dealt a decisive blow to Akong, resulting in Roland retiring and moving to Copenhagen. He changed his identity several times and laid a low profile, eventually becoming a Danish resident. Roland died from a heart attack at the age of 72 in his Copenhagen home on April 2020. Roland was never caught and even lived to a relatively old age, something that Lim Ban Lim, the most wanted fugitive in Singapore, did not have the privilege to do. Lim Ban Lim was the most notorious 
notorious gangster in Singapore at the time. He was at the top of the most wanted fugitive list in Singapore, had wounded and killed multiple police officers, and orchestrated several large heists where he stole and accumulated $2.5 million, all before the age of 32. What a gangster prodigy. I'm not advocating for gangsterism. Stay in school, kids. Lim Ban Lim was a member of the Giho Secret Society in Singapore. He was reportedly trained as a shooter in Riau Islands, Indonesia, and had a pension for firearms. During his reign as an outlaw, he emerged a ruthless robber and gunman. Yes, guns were not yet banned in Singapore at that time, and he terrorized both Singapore and Malaysia for nearly a decade. Lim started his criminal career just like any other crook, robbing a convenience store of cigarettes. But it was in 1963 when he would go from small-time crook to big-time robber. His first the major heist in 1963 saw him and his gang storming the printing division of The Straits Times at Anson Road, holding the staff at gunpoint and escaping with $30,000 in cash. In 1966, he pulled off his biggest heist in Singapore, where he and his gang broke into the first national city bank in Kolaya Kuei and got away with $156,000. Not too shabby. Unfortunately, the saying fortune favours the bold would ring true as two years later, Lim Ban Lim would cross the border into Johor, Malaysia, where he and his fellow gang members stormed the state treasury of Malaysia. He left with $452,000, as well as a trail of blood that ended with a dead police constable that Lim had shot. Throughout his nine-year reign as a robber in both Singapore and Malaysia, Lim Ban Lim got away with at least $2.5 million. I mean, at that point, he should have just retired, right? But I guess a lot of crooks do it for the thrill of it. And for Lim Ban Lim, it was his lifestyle because he was born into a crime-ridden family. Most of his family and relatives had jail time or were criminals. Lim was also a master of deception, changing his appearance with plastic surgery and sometimes donning a wig and a dress to elude the authorities. He was also ambidextrous and deadly with a gun, earning him respect and fear in the criminal underworld. He once even taunted the head of the criminal investigation department over the phone, saying, You will never catch me. When you come for me, I will be ready for a shootout. I will save the last bullet for myself so you can only claim my corpse. God. Damn, that's cool as fuck. I'm not advocating for gangsterism. <laughs> and this bravado would probably be the reason why he engaged with such a large number of shootouts with the authorities. For example, in May 1965, Lim became one of Singapore's most wanted fugitive after he took a revolver from an officer and fired, wounding the detective. Lim later mailed the revolver to a newspaper editor with a note. As a measure of self-defense, I took the revolver and ran away. I could have shot the detective while he was down, but what for? I'm not sure why he decided to do that. Perhaps it was an act to paint him as a merciful outlaw. A year later in 1966, Lim shot another officer who had arrested his friend in the lobby of a cinema. The officer was wounded in the leg and a $2,000 bounty for Lim was announced immediately by the authorities. However, it was not until this shootout that led to the death of a young police officer that Lim would see a record bounty at the time being placed on him. On June 23, 1968, Lim killed officer Ko Chong Tai, a 27-year-old corporal. Ko had spotted Lim walking out of a shop house in Rangoon Road at around 1.20pm that day. He and two other officers decided to tail Lim to a vacant plot of land. It was there that Lim sprung out to confront the officers with a browning automatic pistol and demanded that the corporal hand over his revolver. Corporal Ko refused and a struggle ensued. The officer broke away and ran behind a parked car. Lim followed the wounded officer and it was then when he shot Corporal Ko in the chest. Despite being shot, the corporal drew his revolver and tried to fire back at Lim. Unfortunately, he missed and Lim fired back. This time, at point-blank range and aimed at the forehead, killing Corporal Ko. However, this was not the end of the saga. Another officer picked up Corporal Ko's revolver and began a running gun duel with Lim. He chased Lim through a maze of back lanes, parked cars and stalls around Owen Road. Another detective would turn up and also began firing at Lim. Still, Lim would slip through their grasp as he was able to jump into a taxi where he disappeared from sight. What a slippery bastard. Also, this sounds really hard to imagine that it's Singapore. But before how strict gun laws were introduced, this was a fairly common thing to have shootouts with the police. It blows my mind how safe we are right now. Soon after, the police conducted a massive manhunt for Lim, screening his picture on every TV in the country. A $5,000 reward was issued for the arrest of Lim, but less than a year later, the police doubled the reward to $10,000 and then to a record $17,000 by November 1972. And this was a huge amount back then. But it was during this very month that Lim Ban Lim would engage in the final gun battle 
of his life. Officers had received a tip off that Lim and his right hand man, Chua, had returned to Singapore after spending months in Macau and would be visiting a night market at Margaret Drive in Queenstown. At 7:30 p.m., six police officers took up positions to ambush the country's most wanted criminal. They would soon see Lim and Chua walk into a row of shops across the road. Ten minutes later, the duo rushed out of the shop, fleeing in opposite directions as they fired at the police. Officers returned fire, but it was difficult to aim as the road was full of pedestrians attending the nearby night market. Officers eventually caught up to Lim where he would meet his fateful end. Lim was shot three times in his body by the police. After staggering for about 10 meters, he collapsed onto the ground, clutching his revolver in his left hand as he died. Lim Ban Lim had gained such notoriety that 33 inmates escaped from a reformative training center just to attend his funeral. And while it seemed like Lim Ban Lim lived like a gangster till his very last breath, Tan Cho Jin, also known as the One-Eyed Dragon, had a rather pitiful end to his gangster career. Tan Cho Jin was part of the infamous Ang Sun Tong gang. It existed since the 1950s and had a vast criminal network in trafficking drugs and illegal money lending in Singapore and Malaysia. Tan had also engaged in such activities and during his time in the gang, Tan rose through the ranks and became a feared triad leader of the underworld. But in 1999, he met with an accident that would scar him for life. He was in a traffic collision and although he survived, Tan Cho Jin suffered an eye injury when shards of glass flew into his right eye, blinding him in the process. Thus the nickname The One-Eyed Dragon. Gangs and their cool ass nicknames. Kinda wish I had one. The Five Head Fighter. The One Eyed Dragon was a savvy businessman as well. He ran multiple businesses, such as a traditional medicine shop which had four branches, which made him affluent enough to own multiple branded cars. But it was in 2006 that his name would be known throughout the country as one of the most dangerous gangsters in Singapore. Lim Hock Soon was a friend of Tan Cho Jin, the former being a nightclub owner. However, their friendship turned sour when Lim refused to repay a gambling debt of $220,000. Tan demanded that that Lim returned his gambling debt, but was met with rejection. This infuriated Tan, which he said his ego was hurt by his friend's response. And in the underworld, honor, loyalty, and face was a very touchy matter. He felt extremely disrespected by Lim for not honoring his word, which led Tan to contact a friend in Thailand, and he got himself a Beretta pistol. On the morning of 15 February 2006, Tan barged into Lim's apartment, armed with a knife and a pistol. The gunman kicked Lim, who was sleeping on a mattress in the living room. Shocked at Tan's violent arrival, Lim demanded to know what he wanted, to which the one-eyed dragon replied, I have a gun, do you want me to shoot? Tan then ordered Lim to tie up his wife, maid, and teenage daughter with towels, after which he forced Lim to open a safe, collecting jewelry, cash, and Rolex watches totaling $170,000. Tan then brought Lim into the study room, where he would fire around at Lim's face at point-blank range. More shots followed, and Lim was shot a total of five times on his right cheek, right temple, left arm, left thigh, and his back. Which to me suggested that this was a very personal attack. Why else would the one-eyed dragon fire at a dead body? Tan then went into the master bedroom where Lim's wife and daughter were, and he warned them by saying, It is your husband that went too far. I give you your life. Don't identify me or else I will kill your whole family. Something which the family obviously did not abide to. The following days saw the accident execution of a 10-day manhunt to capture the fleeing dragon. Tan had escaped to Johor Bahru, Malaysia, where he called on a gang leader in the city to aid him with his escape. Little did he know that he was already being tailed by the Malaysian police. Tan was rather clever in eluding the police. He had gotten himself a crew cut to change his appearance and switched hotels every two days to avoid being caught. Unfortunately, he made the wrong move by choosing to stay in expensive hotels rather than keeping a low profile. Tan would find himself hiding out in the five Star Grand Plaza Park Royal Hotel in Kuala Lumpur. But unbeknownst to him, the police was already in the hotel and would devise a cunning plan to apprehend the fugitive. At midnight on February 25th, the one-eyed dragon had a craving for Hainanese chicken rice, which he ordered through room service. Seizing this opportunity, the police sent up an undercover cop posing as a waiter to deliver his food. They stuck a listening device on one of the dishes, listening and waiting for the right moment to strike. At around 2 a.m., 
them when nothing but snores could be heard. Twelve police officers barged into the room, finally apprehending the one-eyed dragon and his gang. Now, when someone is accused of a major crime like murder, the best thing to do would be to secure a top lawyer in town to defend yourself, right? In the case of Tan Chor Jin, not so much. He would be the first man in more than 16 years to conduct his own defense while accused of a capital crime, something that he would soon regret. Surprisingly, he was very confident in representing himself against this capital crime. He was often seen laughing and joking with the guards, even giving the thumbs up to his friends who were seated in the public gallery, and even winked to his wife whenever a witness gave him the answer he wanted. However, his confidence would soon be shattered as many of his arguments would fall flat. For instance, he insisted that it was Mr. Lim who first attacked him with a chair, but the prosecution noted that Mr. Lim would not have been able to lift a bulky chair since he was tied up. The one-eyed dragon also claimed that the gun misfired while he was warding off Mr. Lim's attacks. However, a weapons specialist testified that Tan's gun could not have gone off on its own. The judge also asked, even if the pistol was to misfire, would it fire more than one bullet? To which the weapons specialist replied, no it would not. The high court rejected Tan's defense that he had been drunk and that the shots were fired accidentally, and that he had acted in self-defense after Mr. Lim threw a chair at him. They called his claims a laughable fantasy. Which, to be fair, his claims were quite a stretch. How could he have accidentally fired five shots? Like, five consecutive shots? Oops. Oopsie, oops. This was when the one-eyed dragon realized he made a foolish decision in rejecting proper representation. When the judge asked if he needed anything to prepare for the closing, Tan replied, If I say I need a lawyer now, how? Tan was eventually sentenced to death by hanging on the 9th of January 2009, almost three years after his heinous crime. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hit the like button if you did and consider subscribing. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.